Hello, and welcome once again to Cultural Caravan. I'm your host, Ed Werner, for this series. And today, we're going to study Kenosha and Kenosha County history from 1910 to the middle 1920s. A couple of very interesting things happened in Kenosha during that time. For example, in 1911, Kenosha had the first open air school in the state of Wisconsin. Also in 1911, you've probably heard about the great devastating powder mill explosion that happened in Pleasant Prairie. In 1913, the Kenosha Police Department received their first motor-driven police car. And, of course, 1917, 1918 was World War I, and Kenosha had its part in that. And you probably have recalled or heard about Victory Way. In 1925, people out in the county discovered old Indian effigy mounds proving that the Indians were here in this area many, many years before Kenosha was founded. So, let's enjoy episode eight of the history of Kenosha and Kenosha County. Kenosha's first motor-driven fire truck was made in Kenosha by the Thomas B. Jeffrey Company in October of 1910. Kenosha was the first city in the state of Wisconsin to have a motorized fire truck, and it was the last word in firefighting apparatus. The truck was named the Mayor M.J. Scholey, and Fire Chief Iserman, at the time of acceptance, drove it around town himself to show it off. The following year, 1911, in Fire Chief Iserman's annual report to the City Council, he urged the Council to get rid of the horse-drawn fire equipment and install a completely motorized fire department. He stated that the cost of maintaining a pair of horses during the last year was $411, while the cost of maintaining the only motor truck was $64. In December of 1913, the City Council received $750 from the sale of horses and wagons and other fire department equipment which had become obsolete with the installation of the motor-driven equipment. This photograph is a copy from a postal card. It is the same fire truck as shown in the previous photograph. Kenosha at this time, 1910, had probably the fourth automobile fire engine in the United States. Springfield, Massachusetts, Joplin, Missouri, and Detroit, Michigan each had one truck by that time. However, Kenosha did have the first motor-driven fire engine in Wisconsin. It was built on a Jeffrey Rambler chassis and had the Persh hose body, ladders, and chemical engine mounted on it. Its value was $5,000. It proved very successful and served for 10 years, being replaced by newer and larger rigs. The engine was given to the city by the Jeffrey Company in exchange for vacating a street along the east side of the factory. The Kenosha Fire Department was also the first in the state to be completely motorized and one of the very first in the United States. This photograph of the John B. Persh Wagon and Repair Shop was taken about 1910. The location of the repair shop was on the east side of Exchange Street, that is Fifth Avenue, between Market Street and Park Street or between 56th Street and 57th Street. This shop building was built by James Adams about 1879 for the manufacture of wooden pumps, which were much used for farm purposes. Over the following years, many small manufacturers used the building, and it was finally covered by buildings of the Simmons Company. This is the first federal post office on its original location the west end of Market Square, 56th Street. The building was completed in the early part of 1910 and was opened for business on May 1st, 1910. It was subsequently moved across the Civic Center and relocated at 56th Street and 10th Avenue during the winter of 1933 and 1934. Remodeling was completed in the summer of 1936 and today the building houses 
the Kenosha Public Museum. This boulder with the tablet thereon denotes the site of the first free school erected outside of New England. The first free school class was held in the basement of St. Mark's Church, now St. James Church, in 1845. Just a block away, the first high school building was erected at this site and dedicated in 1849. The boulder came from the William C. Douse Farm located on the Green Bay Trail at Dexter's Corners in Pleasant Prairie. It was found in the old woodlot of this farm and the boulder is located just south of where the old high school annex stood. This is a, a photograph of the first open-air school in Wisconsin. In the 1910 sale of Christmas seals, the Wisconsin Anti-Tuberculosis Association offered as one of its prizes complete equipment for an open-air school to any city of 15,000 population or above making the highest per capita sale of Christmas seals. Another prize offered was a month's service of a visiting nurse to the 12 cities of from 10,000 to 55,000 population, making the highest per capita sales. The nurse to serve cities in the order of the amount of sales. Due largely to the active work of Dr. G.A. Wittesheim, both of these prizes were won by Kenosha. Mrs. Mary D. Bradford, superintendent of schools, suggested to the Board of Education that an open-air school be created with the $500, which would come to Kenosha as its share of the proceeds from the anti-tuberculosis seal sales. The building was not ideal, but was the best that could be provided with the money allowed. It was a plain board building with a tent roof and more than the usual number of windows on a south side. It was located near the Frank School. The public announcement of the winning of prizes was immediately followed by the arrival of Miss Sarah West Ryder, a nurse, a part of whose assigned work was to find the candidates for the open air school. The school was opened in April of 1911 with Mrs. Irene Keating as teacher and Mrs. Clara Whitaker as a matron. The children were fed and rested. It ran nine weeks before summer vacation. This view of the first Chicago North Shore and Milwaukee station was taken in June 1911. It shows a North Shore train just leaving. The location of this station was on the north side of Elizabeth Street or 63rd Street. The street in the foreground is Elizabeth Street before paving and with Kenosha's first streetcar track in the center of, of the street. The track turned north passing the east entrance of the station this being the end of the line and turnaround place. This station was used until the completion of the depot on the south side of 63rd Street, now the location of the station restaurant. With a roar like the sound of a tornado, and with a power which shook the earth like an earthquake, millions of pounds of dynamite and powder exploded at the plant of the Laughlin Rand Powder Company at Pleasant Prairie just after 8 o'clock Thursday evening, March 9, 1911. Not only had a great plant of the company covering hundreds of acres been destroyed, but the people of the village and the surrounding territory found their homes and farms devastated. The awful earth shock which followed the letting go of the great mass of explosives was felt over a territory covering more than 500 miles from Kenosha. Portions of the remains of E.S. Thompson the only fatality of the explosion, were found just after 11 o'clock the next day, 200 feet from the glaze room where the first explosion occurred. Eight other employees were injured. The search for bodies continued for some time. The remains of Mr. Thompson were brought to the Rutledge morgue in Kenosha, and Coroner Stanton called a jury and an inquest to be held. Within an hour after the explosion, Sheriff Andrew Stahl rushed a force of 60 deputy sheriffs to the village, and these men patrolled the village and prevented people from going into the zone of danger. Aided by these deputies, Sheriff Stahl made the rounds of the ruined houses of the village and gathered up the women and children, packed them into band wagons and automobiles, and sent them to Kenosha for the night. All but two of the women accepted the hospitality. 
During the night, it was claimed that an effort was being made to loot some of the damaged houses, but Sheriff Stahl ordered his deputies to shoot on sight. The wave of the explosion seemed to have carried to the south and east of Pleasant Prairie. The King's store, which stood on the principal corner of, of the village, was a mass of ruins. It was not only shaken on its foundation, but a great piece of machinery from one of the buildings of the plant was driven through the roof to the cellar. Of the 50 buildings in the village, not one of them was without damage to some degree. The big boarding house on the main street collapsed at the first explosion. The estimated damage of glass in Kenosha alone was set at $15,000, and this cost estimate was made at 1911 prices. It was said there were 80,000 kegs of blasting powder, 25 pounds each, five carloads of dynamite and a large amount of sporting powder in this explosion. Some of the buildings that were damaged in Kenosha alone were the New Columbus School, Badger Brass Company, Chicago Brass Company, Dave's Clothing Store, William F. Fisher Dry Goods Store, Kimball Building, Flanagan Building, St. George's Church, and the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Passenger Coaches. By March 20th, 1911, more than 500 claims had been filed against the E.I. DuPont Company, and more were expected. The photograph you are looking at and the five following photographs were made by the official photographers of the DuPont Company and were released after the many claims had been settled. At the time of the explosion, the cameras of all photographers who eluded the cordon of guards were confiscated and photographic plates were destroyed by workmen of the company. The following five photographs, plus this one, were selected from many official photographs. This photograph showed the powder company chimney and water tower after the explosion. This photograph is of the wrecked factory building showing ruined machinery and scattered debris, the ruined powder house and the water tower in the distance. Destruction moved with a force that carried everything before it. The flames swept over the entire plant, and within five minutes after the first explosion, the great plant was one mass of flame. This shows all that was left of one of the powder factory storage buildings. The light buildings of the plant went up like wildfire. This photograph of scattered wreckage shows how it covered acres of land surrounding the plant. The force of the explosion picked up the heavy machinery used for powder making and twisted it into useless scrap and hurled it thousands of feet from the seat of the explosion. This is a hole in the ground where once a building stood. This hole was 300 or 400 feet long and 100 or more feet deep. This was the Powder Company boarding house in the village of Pleasant Prairie. The photograph was taken after the first explosion. This photograph of Market Square was published in a pictorial souvenir of the police and fire departments of Kenosha, published by Harry Wilkinson in 1912. The center portion of the square at this time was arranged as a park with flowers, lawns, shrubs, and a large cannon from the War Department. This small park was created about 1900. The automobile at this time was becoming more popular, and therefore there was a demand that this part of Market Square be given to a place for the parking of automobiles. In December of 1932, the City Council was petitioned to convert this space for the free parking of automobiles. On June 12, 1912, the Milwaukee, Racine, and Kenosha Electric Railroad sent its first car into Kenosha, stopping at Market Square. The car shown in this photograph is without a doubt one of the first cars. The name Market Square was given to this space because when the city was first plotted out in the early days of Southport, this part of Market Square, or 56th Street, was reserved as a marketplace where farmers could congregate to sell their produce, wood, hay, grain, livestock, beef, pork, and what have you. This is Kenosha's first motor-driven police car in 1913. In 1911, the police department asked the city council to consider purchasing an automobile patrol wagon. 
The cost was estimated at $3,000 for a Rambler. Two years later, this police car was purchased. It wasn't until 1915, however, that the old horse-drawn paddy wagon was put up for sale. It took until October 11, 1931, for the police department to get their new motor police patrol car. It then succeeded the former horse-drawn patrol wagon. 200 of these French Army forage carts were made by the Bain Wagon Company in February of 1915 for the French government according to their specifications. They were used to carry the equipment for shoeing horses and other work in connection with the French Army. The cart was drawn by two horses hitched in tandem. The contract was for $177 for each cart. By May 16, 1915, the Bain Wagon Company completed the shipment of 500 carts and 1,000 wagon poles to be consigned to the belligerent countries in Europe. 3,800 of these standard U.S. Army steel axle wagons were built by the Bain Wagon Company during the years of 1917 and 1918 for the U.S. Army. At the close of the war, many of them were sold for commercial use, especially along the Mexican border. This is a view in the Allen and Sons Company tannery during the World War I days when women filled the places of the men who were called into military service. This photograph shows women finishing leather during World War I in the Allen tannery. This is a view of women sorting leather during World War I in the Allen tannery. Nash trucks were sold to the United States government during the war years of 1917 and 1918 and are shown being loaded for shipment to the U.S. Army in France. This loading platform was located in the shipping yards of the Nash Motors Company. Shipments were made at the rate of 25 to 40 trucks per day. Checks were received from the government as large as $2 million for these shipments. America entered World War I in 1917, and at the time the Nash Motors Company took over the Jeffrey plant, the company was making both passenger cars and trucks. The demand for Army transport vehicles brought about a specialization in truck manufacture in the new Nash plant. So well organized was the production under the direction of Mr. Nash that in 1918 his company was the largest producer of trucks in the industry. This is the Camp Harvey Boulder during the Civil War. In 1861, Colonel Edward Daniels was authorized by the War Department to recruit and organize one battalion of cavalry in Wisconsin. The location selected to quarter the recruits was changed from Ripon to Kenosha, and the site was called Camp Harvey. Here, the unit organization was perfected and mustered into federal service on March 8, 1862. The regiment left the state on the 17th of March for St. Louis. The unit participated in many battles during the war, and a detachment was involved in the pursuit and capture of Jefferson Davis, the president of the Southern Confederacy. The regiment losses were killed in action, 54, died of wounds, 18, died of disease, 293, and died of accidents, 8. During World War II, one, patriotic fever ran high, and in 1917 at a site selected by Mr. Frank H. Lyman, this boulder was set to mark the campsite of the 1st Wisconsin Cavalry, a unit that fought in the Civil War. It is located in about the center of what is now Green Ridge Cemetery. Victory Way was erected on Market Square in 1919 when the city of Kenosha formally welcomed her doughboys home from World War I. To celebrate the occasion, a great demonstration was arranged for July 4, 1919. The person taking this photograph stood on the west end of Market Square looking in an easterly direction. The two tall chimneys in the distance are a part of the Simmons Company plant. Victory Way on Market Square was a tribute to the memory of those who did not come back, as well as a tribute to those who returned. Each of the pillars carried an allied flag and the inscription of some major engagement 
in which Kenosha troops took part. On Friday morning, July 4th, 1919, the Great Parade started promptly at 9.30 a.m. when the Grand Marshal gave the command forward march to the 1st Division gathered at the corner of Chicago Street and Park Row, that is at 8th Avenue and 68th Street. The parade first marched in review before the grandstand made of the porticos of the Elks Club where many of the war mothers cheered their Coast Guard, Marine, soldier and sailor sons as they passed in review. Then, as the Great Line reached Market Square, the bands played On Wisconsin and the Stars and Stripes Forever while the returning soldiers marched down the Great Victory Way. In the Kenosha City Directory of 1921, page 131, this full-page advertisement of the Bain Wagon Company's farm wagon is shown. The narration for the advertisement is as follows. The Bain Wagon made Kenosha a manufacturing town. The Bain Wagon Company makes the same kind of a wagon as has always been made since the factory started in 1852. If you own a farm, buy the Bain Farm Wagon. If you are a teamster, buy the Bain Teaming Gear. This partial view of a downtown section of Kenosha was taken in 1922 from the roof of the Elks Club, looking in a northeasterly direction. In the immediate foreground is seen the flat roof of the Helberstadt Flats on Park Street or 57th Street at Chicago Street, that is 8th Avenue. This was built about 1890. The structure of the many squares between the Halberstadt Flats and the post office is the framework built to mold the cement basement wall of a skyscraper that never got beyond the point shown in this photograph. All of this block became the property of the United States Postal Department. Upon this property was built Kenosha's second and current post office. To the right of the center is the old city hall to the north, beyond Market Street, 56th Street, are the factory buildings of the Bain Wagon Company. Still further north and across the Pike Creek are the buildings of the Allen Tannery. The bronze tablet was placed on the tower of the 6th Avenue Bridge on December 12, 1923, by the Kenosha chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. The tablet reads simply, Southport, 1835, Kenosha, 1925, Daughters of the American Revolution. The Kenosha chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution was organized in the month of January 1896. Mrs. J.H. Kimball organized the chapter and was its first regent. The second courthouse of Kenosha County was built and completed on November 13, 1885. It was located on the southeast corner of the intersection of 56th Street and Sheridan Road before those streets were widened. It was demolished in the early 1930s to make way for the new post office. Kenosha's third courthouse and jail was located on the corner of Sheridan Road and 56th Street. It was built in 1925 at a cost of $1 $168,958.80. Cut into the stone above the main entrance of the building is this inscription, erected by the people of Kenosha County to the cause of just and capable government. The cornerstone contains a history of Kenosha's new buildings, pictures of Civil War veterans of Kenosha County, and also photographs of World War I veterans. This is the old Green Bay Trail near Dexter Woods. The first white men who entered the territory, which is now Wisconsin, traveled in Indian bark canoes by way of the rivers. On land, they followed the winding trails of the Indians through forests and over the prairies on foot. Settlements in the wilderness depended on the ox cart for transportation, then the horse-drawn wagon, and later finer wagons and carriages. Plank streets replaced mud roads, and concrete and automobiles and trucks followed in time. In 1925, a section of the old Green Bay Trail could be still seen in the area known as Dexter Woods. 
This photograph of an Indian effigy mound was taken from an airplane in 1925. This state archaeological field work from an airplane was first done in Kenosha County due to the work of Mr. C.W. Beamer of Kenosha. Mr. Beamer's report of the project, dated July 6, 1927, states, quote, the nearest mound available for the experiment lies a half mile south of the Racine Kenosha County line on a rising ground of pasture and oak openings overlooking the Fox River. The effigy is evidently intended to represent the panther, an Indian water spirit. It lies on both sides of Highway 83, the body on the west side and the tail on the east side. The effigy appeared to indicate that the Indians settled here from very early times. This photograph shows the outlining of the Indian effigy mound. This outlining was necessary to be able to photograph it from an airplane. This effigy was located on Highway 83, north of Highway 50, on the John Kirkman farm. This is a photograph of the last gas-fueled lamppost in Kenosha. It stood in front of the Kimball home at 414 Prairie Avenue, that's 60th Street, on the north side of the street, halfway between Congress and West Streets, that is between 10th and 11th Avenues. General John Bullen, in 1836, almost entirely from his own means, built across the Fox River a substantial bridge, the first bridge over the Fox River between Dundee, Illinois, and Burlington, Wisconsin. It was called Bullen's Bridge. Since this first bridge of 1836, there has been built at this point several bridges of both wood and steel construction. In 1929, the replacement bridge shown here bore the name of Silver Lake Bridge. The road over the bridge is County Trunk D, also called the Twin Lakes Road. It is the main highway to Kenosha County Fox River Park. This completes episode eight of our study of Kenosha, Kenosha County history. In the 1920s, you saw the transition, for the most part, of horses to motorized vehicles. Although I recall myself in the 1930s still seeing the milk wagons pulled by horses. But even that is gone. A lot of the buildings, the public buildings, that is, that were built in those days are still around today. So you can see Kenosha is getting pretty modern. I hope you'll join us for our next episode, episode nine in the history of Kenosha, Kenosha County. Thank you once again for watching Cultural Caravan and our history of Kenosha, Kenosha County.